OK. So we're going to continue this course with the second part. That is, we're going to leave ultrasound imaging and come to X-ray imaging, which is a different beast. And today we're going to work with some definitions and ask ourselves how are X-rays produced. Now, X-rays are the very beginning of biomedical imaging. We've already talked last week about this image from Röntgen's wife with a finger ring here. You can see the bones. That was a great success. Actually, in the 50s, you could go to the shoe store and have your feet x-rayed to see if they fit into the shoe. Of course, at some point, people realize that the x-rays have some other effects. We're going to talk about that next week. And so at some point, it is continued that practice. And that was Wilhelm Röntgen, who got the first Nobel Prize in physics for that. Just to give you an idea what the lab looked like, if you think about your lab rotations that you've done nowadays, that's the lab in the 1890s where he did these measurements and observations on x-rays. OK, so now I'm going to show you a video a little bit with the idea behind that x-rays, aside from medical use, um, they produce some quite, quite interesting images. Um, I'll, this will also illustrate the example of the shoemaker. So this is from a museum. This is the original image from Röntgen. Here's a more modern image of a ring. You can see the bones, the higher resolution. Obviously, technology has evolved over the years. Now, this is interesting. What are we looking at here? What is this structure? There's obviously some bone. Here comes the hand. Somebody's got lots of jewelry on their arm. Here are the, the rings again. That's a fish. This is a fetus in a, a, a chick in an egg. We've got some reptiles. They're a very good subject. You've got all the nice structures here, the higher resolution, the fin here. Here's the mouth. Now look at this. What is that? Recognize it? <coughs> Safety pin. It's a shoe. Here are the nails. The inside, you can see the bone. The foot inside for the shoelaces and the safety pin for the socks or whatever. I suspect the person who's wearing these shoes is probably more of the style goth than anything else. OK, so X-ray imaging. And now we're looking at the electromagnetic radiation. And we've got the whole wavelength, the whole spectrum here in front of us from very short wavelengths to very long wavelengths. So here are wavelengths on the level of picometers up to kilometers of wavelengths. Ultrasound operates in this range. Then we have magnetic resonance imaging, which is down here, operates in this range. Medical x-rays operate in this range of the wavelengths or frequencies here in terahertz. What is this? Petahertz? Okay, what comes after peta? No? Okay. Pico and nano we know. PET imaging is in this range. So very high frequency wavelength on the order of femtometers to, well, on the order of nanometers to pico picometers. So we got this whole range of wavelengths that are used in biomedical imaging that we're treating in the course. Now, what I want to introduce here, we'll come, up, come back to this uh, display here, is some useful relationships that we need to know. One is the wavelength is given by uh, the speed of, of, of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. Speed of light is 300, what is this, 300 million meters per sec second. 
it's a number that we all know. Then we've got the energy of, of, of the photon that, that transmits the light is given by h nu, where h is Planck's constant. The value is here. And then this is funny unit here that we're going to use in the course. That's just a conversion. It's 4 times e, uh, 10 to the minus 18. This should be 10 to the minus 18 kilo electron volt seconds. And an electron volt is the energy of an electron that acquires in an electric field of 1 volt. OK. We'll see, because if you write this in joule, you got all this 10 to the minus whatever. This E should be actually 10. And so it's a lot of things to write. When you have kilo electron volts or electron volts, we have much less to write. So the energy is actually given by H plus constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And that's an easy way to remember. It's 1.2 kilo electron volts divided by the wavelength in per nanometer. So HC you can express in kilo electron volts. Um, so that's easier to remember in terms of units. So what are the elements of matter that electromagnetic radiation mainly interacts? And in imaging, what we're going to talk about is electrons. It's mainly electrons. So what we're going to look at now is the structure of an atom. So we have electrons, and they have binding energy. They have different layers. We know that. This is the example of tungsten with an atomic number of 74. In the K shell, it has an energy of minus 70 kilo electron volts. In the N shell, uh, in the M shell, it's minus two and a half kilo electron volts. And up here, close to zero, are the valence electrons. So the valence electrons are the ones the chemists worry about because that tells them what kind of chemical reactions the atom can participate in. The physicists don't really care about those, and for our course, we care actually only about these electrons here. Okay, so that's the example of tungsten, and we'll come back to that. So the binding energy decreases with shell distance, and it increases. Here's uh, here's another example. That's hydrogen. So we've got in the K shell minus 13.5 electron volts. Here's the K shell minus 70 kiloelectron volts for hydrogen with an atomic number of one. It's only minus 13.5 electron volts. So the binding energy also increases with atomic number. What's a good qualitative explanation why that is so? Okay. The binding energy, if you will, now this is very loose. It's not proper in the terms of quantum mechanics. Binding energy is how good I can hold on to you. So if you're my electrons and I'm the nucleus, how good can I hold on to you? So I've got lots of protons, I've got lots of positive charge, you're the electron, the attraction is strong, it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of energy to get you away from me. So I'm very positive, the electrons, well not your negative, but you mean in terms of charge. Um, now with distance, okay, if we assume Coulomb force, so how, how good I can hold on to you if you're close to me, then you're the k shell electrons. I can hold on to you better. And for those who are way up, you're in the valence band. And that actually works for the lecture hall, because very often the people who want to go leave earlier, they're just in the last row of the lecture hall. So they're the valence electrons. Lower binding energy. OK, so it's basically what's behind it is, is Coulomb's interaction. OK, now the lowest binding, k shell binding energy that you can find is that of the hydrogen atom. And that's 13.6 electron volts. And that's now the definition of ionizing radiation. If your photon, H nu, carries an energy that's above the binding energy of the K shell for the hydrogen atom, the radiation, the photon's considered ionizing. If it's below, it's considered non-ionizing. So that's the definition. Or to put it very simple, ionizing radiation is radiation where the photon energy has a, bi has a photon energy is above 13.6 electron volt. OK, some additional useful constants. The mass of the electron, the charge of the electron in Coulomb or ampere seconds. Again, the E here stands for 10 to the minus. And actually, now I know why I put E. It comes from the calculator. And you punch E for the exponent. 
Um, and the rest energy of the electron, MEC squared, that's Einstein's relationship, in kiloelectron volts, that's 511 kiloelectron volts. And we're going to need that number later in the course. OK. So now, what is ionizing radiation? If we look at the spectrum, here's our 13.6 electron volts. That's the binding energy of the K shell of the hydrogen atom. That's the definition here. So anything to the right at higher energies, that is higher frequencies, shorter wavelengths, is ionizing. And anything to the left is non-ionizing. If you look at, so you've got the microwave that's non-ionizing, terahertz, infrared. Visible light is non-ionizing. And then you've got ultraviolet, which is ionizing. And that's actually the reason you've got ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. And that's the reason why the company Pitts, Buin, and the like have a business. Because in the light that comes to Earth, there's sufficient ionizing ultraviolet radiation that does damage to our skin. And that's why we put on skin protection when we're outdoors or we're going into the mountains. So that's where these guys go, separate, blocking out the ionizing ultraviolet, the bad ultraviolet. OK, and we're going to deal with ionizing radiation for X-ray imaging. And just as a reminder, that's where the photon has sufficient energy to bump the electron out of its binding energy with the hydrogen atom. OK. So how are x-rays generated? If I were to put up an x-ray scanner here and wanted to scan, well, we'll probably be standing here for several years until we have enough, enough events to produce an image. So one has to create the x-rays artificially. And that's not done with an radioactive source. That's actually done with simple electronics. The principle is here. You have a negatively charged cathode that serves as an electron source. That's this thing here that's negatively charged. And you drive now a current through that filament, which heats up the cathode. So that's the cathode here. And now why would you want to heat up the cathode? To heat up the cathode, you give the atoms and the electrons more energy. And so if they have more energy, the probability that they will escape the cathode and go into the vacuum is higher than if it's cold, because then they are moving less. So it just increase the kinetic energy. So here's the current. We drive through the filament to heat it up. And then the electrons are liberated and accelerated by an electric field. And the electron gets an energy of its charge times the uh, difference in voltage. So here's now the anode, the cathode. You apply uh, 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 tension across this. And these liberates the electrons that then hit the target on the anode. So the anode is a metal target that's positively charged. It's typically tungsten. So when the accelerated electrons hit the anode, so that's sort of the simplified picture, they generate x-rays. We're going to talk about that later. But basically, the electrons are accelerated. They got kinetic energy. They hit the anode. They're going to be stopped. They have a lot of energy to give up, and they give it up in the form of photons. And those are the x-ray photons. So what you typically have as voltage here between the cathode and the anode is something on the order of tens of kilovolts, 150 kilovolts is a good upper maximum that's being used. And so when they hit it, you've got x-rays that are emitted. And you have around here metal shielding. So actually, this is just a geometric hindrance that only allows the x-rays to go through this window here. Of course, they're generated in all sorts of directions. but um, the direction of the x-rays here is um, through the window. Uh, that's the ones that escape to the subject. <clears throat> we have two fundamental things, experimental parameters that one can adjust in x-ray generation. I've already introduced them without naming them. OK, first we say we're going to drive a current through the filament to heat it up. So I can change that current. I can change the degree to which it heats. And as I change the current, 
essentially, one changes also the number of electrons that can be liberated. The more current I have, the more electrons can be liberated. I have to supply electrons because they're lost when they escape to the anode, to the positive recharge side. OK, so that's the number of x-rays is essentially proportional to the tube current. There's a saturation point, but essentially, one can regulate the intensity of the x-ray by turning up the dial on the current. The second thing that one could change is the voltage between anode and cathode. I gave you 150 kilovolts. One can also set that to 30 kilovolts. What does that change? That change changes the maximum energy that an electron has when it hits the anode. And if one now supposes that that electron, when it's stopped, emits only one photon, that defines the maximum energy that the photons that are emitted can have. So that's the energy of an individual photon, which is proportional to the voltage. So we have tube current, number of photons, a number of electrons, tube voltage, the maximum photon energy that's being liberated. So and those two factors define the characteristics of the X-ray um, and the, its intensity that's being produced. OK. So in the production of the X-rays, one has electrons that hit the anode. They have a kinetic energy, and they're going to stop. And they're going to emit in this process a thing that's called Bremsstrahlung. Now, why is there a German term here? Because all of physics before 1940 happened in Germany. OK, I hope nobody is offended by this, but much of physics was happening in Germany. So the term came from German, and it basically means breaking radiation. It just means the, the, the electron is stopped, it's breaking, and it's emitting radiation. And now we're going to consider this as a simple collision. That now takes us back to first semester physics. We have a stationary atom, and we have the electron that comes in. Here's, the, here's an atom positively charged. The electron comes in, changes its direction, and as it changes the direction, it emits a photon. It loses energy. It's an inelastic collision. Uh, it's an elastic collision, but it loses energy because you can treat that as a collision of an electron and a nucleus in this case. And since the electron changes direction, we need to have conservation of linear momentum. And so we need something to lose um, to have linear momentum in this direction and the linear momentum afterwards, and that's the photon. So we have initial linear momentum of the, of the uh, electron before, PI and PF afterwards, and then we have a linear momentum of the photon afterwards. We treat this as an isolated system, and that gives us, through conservation of linear momentum, a relationship here. So the initial linear momentum is equal to the sum of the final linear momentum of the electron plus that of the photon. We have Coulomb, and we can intuitively now, this is again not quantitatively precise, but just to give you an idea, Coulomb gives us the force that acts on the electron. That gives us sort of the direction change in the velocity and therefore of linear momentum of the electron. Coulomb is proportional to the atomic number divided by the mass of the electron and the distance by which the electron passes by the nucleus. And this is an empirical formula. I'm not going to talk too much, but the power of the Bremsstrahlung depends on the acceleration and these constants here. So the issue here is now that we do not know with what nucleus the electron is going to interact. So we don't know Z a priori. We know the, the charge of the electron, QE. We know the mass of the electron. And we don't know the distance. We don't know how close the electron will pass at the nucleus a priori. We cannot calculate it. So we have no information. And on worse on that, we have no information on the directionality of the x-ray. So there is no information on the directionality of the x-ray in the Bremsstrahlung. But we have some ideas how strong it could be. So the maximum energy, how is that defined? What is the maximum energy of the photon? 
how is it defined? Well, you could think of a situation where the electron comes in and is stopped. Then it has to give off its entire linear momentum to the photon, and that gives its maximum energy. So that is defined, and that is defined by the maximum energy that the photon has, which is defined by the voltage of the tube. So if we now look at Bremsstrahlung, that's the relative intensity as a function of wavelength. Sorry, it's not a function of energy. So a short wavelength is more energy. So to the right is decreasing energy in this graph. So now if we look here, the, the maximum energy here at 50 kilovolts is here. At 40 kilovolts, it's here. And then it decreases 30 kilovolts. And the kilovolts here is now the voltage of the tube between anode and cathode. So that defines the maximum energy. There's not the possibility that the electron can have more energy than 50 kilo electron volts, because 50 volts, kilo volts is the maximum that it has, or in this case, 30. So they cannot have more energy than that. And then we have 20 kilovolts. Here's the maximum, very well defined. OK. Another thing that we need to know to understand the principles of um, X-ray generation is that elastic scattering is proportional to the atomic number squared divided by the energy of the electron squared. That's elastic scattering. And then we have inelastic scattering, which um, releases the photons, and that goes with the atomic number squared. And atomic number here means the atomic number of the target, the anode target. So if and that's why you want the material with, with very high Z. Makes intuitive sense if you have lots of protons, they exert a stronger force on the electron that's shot into the material. And so it's a higher probability that it's deviating the direction and therefore has to give off a photon. So high Z, and this is why tungsten is used as a good target. OK, so that was Bremsstrahlung. I think that's intuitively pretty good to grasp. And now we have a second term that one has to deal with when one looks at X-ray generation, and that is characteristic or fluorescent X-rays. So what does one understand under fluorescent X-rays? And basically what one has is when the electron does not just pass the nucleus, what hits in the atom, uh, an inner shell electron kicks it out, so it liberates an inner shell electron. Then the atom goes into an excited state. It has a higher energy. It has an inner shell vacancy, and that vacancy needs to be filled. So what's happening here? We have an electron that hit here, this K-shell electron, and this is now a vacancy, so there's no electron here. See, there's no minus. The atom is excited, and at some point, an electron from an outer shell will cascade down into the K-shell. So the, uh, the atom goes back to its ground state. When it goes from this shell to this shell, it will emit an X-ray that corresponds to the change in shell binding energy. And that's very well defined. That's, six, in this example, 67 kilo electron volts. So this vacancy is filled by the outer shell electron, which is very often cascading. And because that's a very, this is a very well-defined um, energy here and here, this will produce um, an, an X-ray, a photon, with very sharply defined um, photon energy or wavelength. So this is the illustration, what I was just talking about. Here's the electron. You saw it kicked the ball. It's like billiard in the atom. Let's look at it again. Here it kicks out. The vacancy is here. And now this electron falls down. And as it falls down, it has goes from a higher energy state to a lower energy state. And as it does so, the energy difference has to be given off in the form of a photon. OK, and then what you look at is what you see is the relative intensity here on the y-axis as a function of wavelength. We've seen this graph here, that's Bremsstrahlung, what one calls the Bremsstrahlung continuum with the maximum energy here. And then suddenly you get these spikes here. That's the K-alpha and the K-beta characteristic X-rays. Just means we've got two different K-shells with slightly different binding energies. But this binding energy is released at, a, at this very specific photon energy and at a very specific 
case, and so it's, these are the characters, the X-rays that look like spikes on the hump of Brennstrahlung in, in, in this particular case. So we call them also characteristic X-rays. Then there is Auger, Auger electron emission. So the excited atom, instead of cascading the electron down, the energy that it has, it can also just liberate another electron. That's the so-called OG electron. So in this process, we got the vacancy here. We got the cascading electron. The energy is transferred with it within the electron shells to another electron outside. And that then, in this particular case, becomes a 64.5 kilo electron OG electron. So this is the process here. We have the initial state. We have the incident electron that creates the vacancy here. Then this electron falls down and gives off its energy to the outer shell electron, and this electron is then emitted. So that's the Auger electron. OK, so this brings us to um, the last slide of today's course. And that's just a recap of X-ray generation. I'll just go through, before I show you the animation here, we have, as a recap, we have the positive side on the left. That's the tungsten target. We have the negatively charged filament on the right side. We have a high voltage source, which gives us the voltage difference. We're heating the tungsten filament cathode. And when the electrons hit the target, they produce um, the X-rays. And we'll see this in a nice animation here. <laughs> so now we're looking at the inside. Here's the shield. Here's the target. Can you hear this? So now we have energy instead of wavelength.
Oops, I'm sorry. That was my thing. I've tapped it. Any, um, so the, the 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 conclusion is, as you increase the current, then the intensity of the photons increases. So in the graph, everything just increases. Um, on this video, I don't think I can move this forward in a meaningful way. So we'll conclude here. Um, the assistant should be here at. I hope at 3 o'clock, maybe we'll take a longer break, so we'll bring the, the problem sets. And with that, we will conclude.